Um, and with that, I think I'll just get started. Uh, this disclaimer here, this was uh, an event that happened last week, and this is sort of my best idea of a summary of some, some of my key takeaways. Um, what's great about this W3C event is all of the full talks um, are linked to uh, from the W3C site, so I'm just taking small eg excerpts uh, from each of the presentations, but you can easily get access to all of the materials. So the event itself was called the uh, Inclusive Design for Immersive Web Standards. Uh, it was hosted in Seattle, Washington, and it was Tuesday and Wednesday of last week at a place called Pluto VR. Um, so Pluto VR is one of, uh, they are doing telepresence uh, VR, and they're very interested in um, being a leader in accessibility. So it was great that they were able to offer that space um, and um, bring all these people from around the world together. From the New York City um, contingent, and I think several people here are in the audience here, um, these were at least the ones I was aware of. Andres Cuervo from Movable Inc., uh, Mark Hockinen from Educa Educational Testing Service, Regine Gilbert from New York University, Roland Dubois from Virtual Facility Virtue Leap, Suzanne Taylor from Things Entertainment, and Xi'an Horn from Change Blazer. Um, so we had a good representation of New York uh, there and all of the people that are here tonight would be great to talk to after the event um, for their impressions as well. So what did we kick off with? Uh, Leonie Watson, who if you've come to our meetup, Leonie has actually presented here at Accessibility New York City. Um, and she was also the chairperson for the event. So she started the event with why we're, we're making the immersive web um, accessible to all. And it really starts with, you know, this opportunity with the web being a standard that's open and um, many people can build on top of. It's kind of the most exciting area, or a lot of us that were participating in this group think it's the most exciting area because the history of um, the web has had, you know, great accessibility. It's not locked in. So there's a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of work ahead of us. Um, the next piece that was quite interesting was uh, Matt May from Adobe. Um, he talked about some of the key principles of making web experiences accessible. Um, I was particularly interested in just considering the history of the W3C, thinking about how we did get to the creation of standards, how now we can build like accessible websites, um, use things like ARIA. Uh, it really started back in 1990 with Tim, Tim Berners, Berners-Lee inventing HTML, HTTP. 1994 is when the W3C was founded. And 1997 is actually when the accessibility interest group, so most of the work now that many of us would be familiar with, uh, started from that group um, in 1997. So very cool. And we had dinner with the lady who was one of the co-writers. Yes, yeah, so when, Wendy Chisholm. So Wendy Chisholm was one of the people too that was originally in there at the W3C working from uh, the Trace Center, which was also interesting to me. I didn't know that WCAG or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 1.0, um, a lot of that work had come from the Trace Center um, and University of Austin. Um, we had next Kip Gilbert from Mozilla. So he is, uh, there's lots of companies represented, all of the browser um, vendors had someone there except for Apple. But we had, um, his discussion was really, what's the architecture currently? So what's, what's available and where would accessibility fit into the APIs that are being developed currently at the W3C? Um, I think one of his key points, or one of my takeaways, is that web VR, which is what most of these web in, uh, XR experiences have been built on, is going away. And there's a new standard, web XR. So they've decided to take the AR, augmented reality, VR, virtual reality, um, and combine it into to one uh, new spec that's coming out uh, to all the browsers. Very technical, most of my stuff's gonna be demos, but one of the technical points that was interesting in the changes here is that there is gonna be a way to have the browser know what a primary action is that can be performed. And so this is similar to a lot of assistive technologies need to be able to you know, click a, a button on behalf of someone or cause an action to occur. So there is this primary action um, definition in the new 
um, device API. <clears throat> There's uh, a laser pointer that works like uh, with gaze-based, can be done with a track controller, can be done with a 2D um, computer screen. Um, and then there's this XR import put source event um, that the browser's involved in, but he pointed out that they're currently not available to detect what gets hit by the rays. So like detecting objects um, in that immersive world, not part of the spec yet. Then we had Josh O'Connor from the W3C. So he um, was talking about XR accessibility user needs. Um, he's put together with uh, people in his working group a pretty comprehensive starting point for the considerations for the use cases. Um, and he's very open to getting feedback and collaboration. Um, at the end of the presentation, there'll be lots of opportunities of how you can get involved if you have an interest in this area. One of the areas that popped out for me, because you know I'm someone that in my day-to-day -day work, I'm trying to work with companies to make changes in their technology. And one of the ways we do that is through checkpoints or through requirements. So inside of that um, longer document around user, um, <clears throat> the user experience for XR, they have, I believe it's 35 checkpoints currently defined that are you know, heavily in draft, but interesting to look at um, and consider. So there's things about um, making sure that, let's try, uh, the XR content's compatible with a range of AT, um, avoiding interactions that trigger simulation sickness. Um, so there was a lot of discussion around vestibular disorders and the idea that in XR, that's gonna be something we need to think about um, even more. Um, but there's a whole bunch of them and, I, and I've linked to that full um, document and you can dig into that. Um, here's me, I did some discussions on just existing prototypes. Um, we're actually, my company Equal Entry, gonna be doing a presentation at CSUN next year, um, the big um, accessibility conference in California around the accessibility of immersive media like 360 VR. So um, one of the things that I worked on with James Herndon on my team was working at looking at uh, the Anne Frank House uh, is a current virtual reality experience. Let's see, I've got an audio description here I'm gonna read. So we're in an attic with floral wallpaper and a gray tinted window. To our right, a wooden banister blocks the stairs leading up to our room. To our left, a table is covered in manuscripts bound with twine and a non-electronic bullhorn hangs from a wall. A single light hangs from the ceiling. Straight ahead, a bookshelf is half full with bound materials. On-screen text reads, point to click and move. So that was just a simulation of this video playing, but we were working with a person who was blind um, wearing the headset and just considering the idea of the same way that you might be using a technology out in the real world to get um, sighted assistance to describe what's being seen. You could do the same thing in a virtual world. So currently the diary of Anne Frank, or sorry, the Anne Frank house experience in VR doesn't have any audio description. You know, there's no interactivity. So for a person who's blind to know where to click on the screen, none of that's currently supported, but we wanted just to explore the idea of what, what could you do with like on-demand audio description. And um, I actually have my sister here tonight in the audience, her first time coming to Accessibility New York, but she's part of this scenario here. This is uh, an app called Wander, um, and I thought it's a good UI pattern um, to look at for thinking about uh, immersive media um, descriptions. So in this screenshot, um, we basically have uh, my father here represented by this avatar and my sister here represented by this avatar. And you have basically little circle pointers that show where each person is looking. Um, and so the colors are associated with the, the people that are in the environment. So my dad basically took us to York, South Carolina, which neither of us had ever been to and showed us um, like our grandfather's home and virtual reality and could kind of lead us around and describe, you know, the walkways and the paths. Um, and it was a very compelling experience. Our dad actually bought uh, an Oculus after using it. So I told the people from Oculus, it's 
definitely a great demo because he wanted it right immediately after that. <clears throat> but I'm going to show you the video here of just, this is just my father and I walking down the street inside of um, uh, York, South Carolina. So there's a VR pointer aimed at a white storefront labeled Sylvia, and the VR pointer then moves into the street. It highlights and selects an arrow that moves us farther up and down the street. So basically, inside of this collaborative experience, I can actually see where my father's pointing or my sister's pointing, and then you can navigate um, and, and get to that area. So this is something that I thought was an interesting idea if it was applied to working potentially with someone low vision or blind um, inside of any uh, VR experience, actually being able to see uh, where the person's looking, what they're pointing at, and be there in the experience with them, you know, providing assistance or providing descriptions. Um, so we're going to keep working on that. And like I said, next year we'll actually have a, a full presentation. We're doing user studies with um, a set of different users um, to try out different techniques. Okay, the, the next, I think this is the next one, yeah. All right, the next one was uh, Zohar Gan. He came from Israel, so we had people really from all over the world at this conference. He has a company called Accessible Realities, and one of the areas he was working on is uh, on the Unreal Engine, um, making a way to provide uh, semantics or accessibility semantics um, through that model. I just picked one demo that I thought was pretty cool showing more of an AR um, scenario, but he has um, identification of different objects in the room. And I'm going to just show this video. So after a scan occurs with his technology, indicated with a sound effect. On-screen text labels show three chairs, a dining table, two cups, and a drinking glass. We zoom closer to the table and scan again. This time, on-screen text labels three chairs, three cups, a dining table, and a cell phone. So I think that'll be happening in a moment. All right, so there's uh, just a new um, object recognition from a new vantage point. Um, and then next, uh, the filmmaker um, accesses the cell phone, flips it over to re reveal an image of a white dog, and then begins the next scan. Once complete, on-screen text labels it a domestic dog. Um, and throughout the video, an on-screen watermark reads phone video recording at 2x speed. So this is a double speed, but it illustrates the idea of, um, I guess, using these AI technologies. Um, if you've seen Seeing AI from Microsoft, it has some functionality kind of like this uh, for exploring pictures. Uh, but this idea was really like being able to get that information repeatedly um, and navigate in the world and ideally get more and more real scanning. Um, Zohar Gan also has a spec and has put in a lot of thought already on a data model around uh, semantics for XR. So that's something I'm interested to learn a lot more in detail. Um, and he has links to that uh, full details of what he's thought about for that data model. Okay, uh, the next one was uh, Chris Joel from Google, uh, and he was talking about the model viewer that's part of HTML5. So he was explaining that one of the core use cases currently on the web for um, basically this XR content would be things like IKEA and Pottery Barn and different furniture stores, you know, or these ideas of commerce, people want to explore objects, um, rotate them. So model viewer current use case is mostly around allowing companies like that to get these 3D models um, to be easily put up and loaded on the web. Um, he had this, I think, a great quote, and this is a good one to, to think about, that this new term or, or word to become familiar with, GLTF, it's a file format that's part of, um, basically, he's comparing it to MP3 is to audio, H.264 is to video, and JPEG is to Im images, so GLTF is to 3D. So basically that uh, astronaut object is a GLTF file that gets referenced. 
And um, he was showing very simple code, but I was excited to see, you know, because I've seen so little uh, progress currently in, in what's available to what can be done accessibly. Uh, there is an alt attribute. So our old friend, the alt attribute on this model viewer component. So in the current released um, model, I tried setting this. You can load it up with voiceover or a screen reader and you will get um, that description. They also are doing some work to tell you when you've rotated the model to the backside or to some different angles. And they had some discussion in the spec of how they would add additional labels you know, to more detailed parts of the object. So potentially you might want to label the helmet separate from the gloves, separate from the boots. So they have that in a spec phase, but not in an implemented phase. But it's, it was very interesting. Okay, and then the next presentation, um, I really love this uh, tool. So this is uh, authoring immersive environments. Mozilla has this product called Hub and a product called Spoke. Hubs, sorry, it's the name of the product. And Liv Erickson from Mozilla talked about some of their plans for what they're doing to um, make that environment accessible. They, it's probably one of the you know, best demo apps for web VR um, because it does use so much of the functionality available um, in the spec. So some of the things she said that Mozilla is um, looking ahead to focus on inside of this world is to make sure this idea of spatial accessibility structures. So you know the, the fact that in uh, the 3D world we have to have relationships of what's in front of us, behind us. Um, they want to be able to set alternate text onto different objects you put into the world. Um, they want to have application-specific ways to give information, um, especially captioning. So when we're talking, it's a social world where you can meet up with people and talk. So the idea that, like we have closed captioning at this event, we'd be able to have captioning inside of the immersive world. Um, and then they're very open to continue learning and adapting to new information. So I made a couple of videos um, since uh, seeing the presentation just to illustrate um, a few of the points about using Mozilla Hubs for social VR and just to help uh, further the discussion of what could be possible. So I made a room, uh, Accessibility New York City, Cooper Hewitt, <laughs> very on brand here. Um, but this is showing, this is functionality inside of Hubs where you can import objects. So I'm looking in the Art tab and I'm putting into my virtual room um, a painting or a wall painting. So notice when I created it on the back side of it, there's no image, so I have to flip it around. And then I have um, basically like a sort of digitized rendering of the Mona Lisa um, that I can pull in. Now, so for someone who is blind um, that might come into this room, understanding what that object is, right? We could either have someone else in the room walking around describing um, what that object is, or we could have something like an alt text for the GLTF format to give it a label, allow someone to ask what that object is and get that information back. Just wanted to show we have the same problem like we do on the web where you could have uh, the same objects having the same labels. So, you know, one idea that I had that I thought, well, we should try to reuse all the different labels that already exist in the store because those are, you know, semantic discoverable items. But here we can see that in this particular instance, both of those objects are named wall painting. So if we were going to use just the information that came from the store, there's really no additional details about like, well, what is that a painting of? And as we know with alt text, the context is always really important. So depending on the room that we're creating, um, whether or not we wanted to describe that one wall painting has mountains and the sun on it, and one looks like the Mona Lisa, that's additional functionality or additional metadata that needs to be discovered and discussed. How could that be made accessible and usable um, by people that can't see these objects? And then this is me placing that on the wall next to the Mona Lisa. It's kind of a fragile wall painting. 
But yeah, so you basically can set up your room and I, I'll put a link to this room. You can go on your computer and uh, load up the room. You don't have to be inside of virtual reality to do these experiences. So that's another great thing about hubs. You can do it on a um, desktop computer, walk around in the 2D world and still see all the objects and control the functionality. Okay, the next uh, demo, some, some really cool technology from the Microsoft Research Group, um, Seeing VR is uh, a set of tools. This is basically based off of Unity, but can apply to web um, XR as well. And these tools were really focused on low vision um, accessibility use cases. So I think it's at least a suite of uh, nine tools. I think it's even more. But I picked just two of the tools to show you a little demo of um, their ideas about the functionality. So this is going to be a bifocal. Um, Oops, no, sorry, this is a depth measurement tool. So this is, uh, many people with low vision have difficulty with depth perception and actually grabbing virtual objects. So their um, add-on actually adds a pointer or selection UI that makes it easier to grab objects so, so that you can hit test and pick up objects um, potentially with you know, a high contrast wand or something more uh, easy to see than maybe the hands or what's been generated inside of the virtual environment. Um, so if we looked at Hub's example and manipulating those paintings, they were pretty thin and could be difficult to reach. So this kind of tool where we could maybe have a add-on for people that need it to say like, we shouldn't have such fine dexterity to grab objects. We can provide this adaptive tool that lets us uh, select the object to manipulate it. I'll show this video from down here. All right, here's the bifocal example. So this was the idea of like having uh, bifocals just like if you were wearing them, you can have part of the world not magnified and then have a section of the viewport magnified. So they're showing picking up a book um, and maybe looking at the book through the, the bifocal part to magnify that area. And they're showing you can adjust, you know, because it's in VR, you can move around um, where that magnifier is. And so this is a tool that you could add into a Unity project and get this functionality. Um, and potentially allow someone with low vision to, you know, better interact inside of that world. Um, one of the other ideas that they had that I thought was very cool, and I, I tried it out uh, just myself with seeing AI, the, the Microsoft app. So this is... Uh, taking a picture of my room in Mozilla Hubs with the Seeing AI app um, on my iPhone. And so with Seeing AI processing the virtual objects, it says it seems to be a flower pot, house plant, design, plant, interior. So this is sort of the current state of Seeing AI is it can kind of sometimes guess, you know, rough pictures, not a very verbose or maybe meaningful description, but it's exciting to see that you know, that's progressing and that's part of the research that they were discussing as well as the ability to improve the AI algorithms to automatically detect virtual objects and label them for people and also the ability to send pictures from inside virtual reality to a remote service to be described and then have that description come back to the person while they stay inside the virtual environment. So they were doing the AI version and the human assisted version um, as demos as well. Next, we had uh, spatialized audio on the web. And so Chris Wilson from Google um, talked about that. Uh, he had an example of showing the complexities of what can be done uh, with the web audio APIs now. He built a vocoder um, using uh, just uh, the web audio technologies. And he says it's currently used as like a stress test um, by a lot of the browsers to see um, 
you know, how well they perform because it's doing a lot of uh, visualizations and, and sound manipulation. So one of the things he talked about was, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in, in audio, but one of the areas that's kind of current and advanced for improving the sound sphere is this idea of ambisonics. Um, so it's full sphere surround sound format um, that you can use to encode and decode 3D audio streams. And he talked about there's a Chrome plugin called Omnitone that you can use to actually listen to some demos now, get an idea of like um, maybe how more immersive that can, can sound. Um, I made another quick short video of like what I currently see in immersive uh, XR is a lot of times all that's being used spatially is to tell you if you're in a room chatting with people, is the person to the right of you or to the left of you. So in hubs, if you try out hubs, uh, when you go in and there's another person in the room, they can hear your voice and depending on where you're standing um, and moving in the space, uh, they can hear you to the right or left. So in this case, I'm working with James and I'm saying, I'm gonna walk to one side of you, start talking, turn to the side where you hear the audio and, and let me know if you can hear me from where I'm talking from. And so then James said, turns around and he can hear the audio changing um, to come now, not out of just one side of the ear, but to come kind of equally into both ears, know that he's um, facing me. And we'd had some success with that, um, also testing with a member of our team, uh, Sophia, in Altspace VR, which is a different social VR world. And it's kind of interesting to say that just with spatial audio, you could have someone follow you around in this virtual space, you know, stay with your avatar. They don't necessarily need to see what's happening on the screen. If they can hear you calling from an area, um, you know, they can use that as a location device. So cool. Um, and there was some discussion around, uh, we get excited about spatialized audio, there's all these new things we can build, but let's think about like, one, people who are deaf, or also think about people who can only hear out of one ear. So, you know, there's always for accessibility considerations we need to make. We can't have uh, any of these technologies be the sole way of accessing information. So that I thought was an interesting one about okay, how could we consider directing people's attention if they can't hear the spatialized audio cue? Which tees up um, this presentation from Wendy Daniels, who's a professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, she's doing research uh, with the HoloLens uh, with students that are going into a planetarium, um, and they're basically She's exploring different ways to provide, um, using XR, um, captions and sign language for the students so that they can watch the planetarium presentation, but also get um, the captions or get the communication. So she talked about, you know, and I would imagine this would apply here to the Cooper Hewitt, uh, some of the current methods that exist for providing access to like uh, installation would be you know, one, a person comes to the event, there's no assistive, uh, assistive technologies, there's no accommodation. So when the person's explaining something about the picture, they just don't, they're confused, they don't have a uh, uh, facilitation. The second one is showing that oftentimes the interpreter might be standing off maybe to the left of the painting and the person describing it would be on the right. So you, you have to direct your gaze, you know, from looking at the object being described, maybe looking at the person talking about it, and then looking to your interpreter. Um, you could have someone like Mirror by Night uh, on site, uh, real-time human captionist, so you might be getting a text stream of what the person's saying, um, presenting about the art piece, but you might have to look at your cell phone or like a computer to read the text, so you're basically changing your gaze, um, you know, changing your uh, focus and attention. And then she gives a few other examples of just, you know, it can get live interpreters and a, a captionist. And she was explaining that if we're just building these things without XR, it's, it can be very difficult to get everything positioned in a place where you can get access, you know, to all of that information at once without looking around lots of places. 
So she, her technology and, and their test was just to look at um, how they could allow someone to pos position a virtual interpreter inside of the um, device. So you could actually choose where the sign language interpreter gets placed. Um, it could be you know, to the right of the artwork, to the left. It could be all depending on that current moment or that current um, experience. Um, they were talking about in the dark, right? So the planetarium's often in the dark, so you would already be losing the sight lines to like a sign language interpreter. So that's a benefit of XR technologies that you'd be able to see the interpreter through like a lens display and still see the rest of the environment in a dark display. And it could be that the artwork is just very far away from where you are. So, and then coming from that, I have a couple of demonstration videos that help illustrate what a few of these technologies could look like. So, uh, Melina Mohn from IRT, um, she had a presentation about subtitles for 360 degree media, and I will show you a couple examples. It's in German, so we might need Roland's help here. But um, the idea is like when we load up this uh, video, the, the first video is showing that there's a directional arrow pointing to the right. So there's a caption of what the person is saying, but the arrow is saying that the person speaking or where the sound is coming from is not in your field of vision. So when we see the right arrow, oops. When we see the right arrow, it's our cue to like turn until we see the arrow disappear. When the arrow disappears, it means the person that the captions are being displayed for is in our field of view and speaking. If we turn our head to the right, now we get an arrow pointing us to the left to say you should direct your attention back to the left if you want to see the person that's speaking. So I, I liked that design, you know, it, it makes sense. Um, and you could see potentially that same design working in like the hubs environment as well. So for someone that couldn't hear the spatial audio cues, you could have you know, the directional arrows to tell you where the sound's uh, coming from. Um, this was me checking. I tried the HoloLens while I was in um, Seattle. And this is um, the idea of how do you position the ASL interpreter. So some of the research that uh, Wendy was talking about as well, this shows one illustration of how you could basically have settings, configuration options for your interpreter. Um, choose the size of the uh, interpreter window, and then you actually can position the interpreter window um, as well. Uh, they did say they usually keep it locked in the, the a specific part of the field of view, and it's also using the arrow pointers, again, to tell you that the uh, interpretation that's being done um, is potentially for the sound in that direction. So it's using still the arrows to direct your attention, but it's overlaying um, an ASL interpreter for people that would prefer um, that type of communication versus text communication. So I thought that was very cool. All right, and now we have uh, Roland Dubois, who's here. Um, you know, we've worked together on multiple um, XR accessibility projects. He's been in the space for um, many years, presented at the, one of the previous uh, W3C meetings that they've had about XR access. Um, I was uh, very interested in his talk. He's, he focused um, one of the talks on making motricity accessible in, VR, uh, in XR. And this is around the idea of one of the um, challenges that he was considering was this idea that in a lot of XR devices, there's an assumption that people can move their head. Um, you know, and so that's not an assumption that we can make about every user. So if the lowest form input that's being said is sort of required in XR is that you can move your head to the left and the right and potentially look behind you, that's going to leave some people out. So he built um, working uh, demo on, on some uh, MIT uh, hackathon and, and awards for this, but he worked off the idea of the sip and puff. You know, if you're familiar with a sip and puff interface, um, it's also just like a, 
a switch interface, but you have the ability to just send some inputs of on and off. And he used uh, short and long and continuous uh, breaths as signals that could be controlled with the GamePad API um, from the uh, W3C standards. And so this is a, a lot of different videos um, of uh, pieces that he worked on. I guess I like to focus in on this video up here at the top uh, showing there's a user uh, in a wheelchair. They're not moving their head, but they have the ability with this selection um, UI to actually have, uh, you know, the selection and the view tilt um, based off of those controls. And those can be controlled with the sip and puff device um, to actually allow someone without moving their head to rotate the views, to actually navigate in the views. So it's got a lot more information on it, but super cool. And obviously a user that we need to be, you know, considering as well as we go into this um, world of XR. All right, we're nearing the end here. We've got, there was a panel discussion about assistive technologies for XR, and I just picked up part that I really enjoyed from uh, Mark Hakkinen. So he was talking about, or one of the discussions in the W3C is, let's not repeat um, ARIA for uh, inclusive XR. So he was saying, you know, ARIA 1.1 is like uh, accessibility code bandages or band-aids, and so it's like, Flexibility and comfort your users will love with added properties for serious accessibility. 81 semantic roles, see back for details. So he's kind of pointing out like when we even look at describing a user interface, right now there's 81 sort of semantic terms and trying to teach developers or all get a shared understanding of what those 81 roles are and should, how they should be consistently applied is difficult and you multiply that into XR, you know, what's a role? Like, do you have a role for like a desk, uh, avatar, a person, a chair? There's, there's so many different things. So the part of the discussion was just the, really the need to rethink assistive technologies and think about, you know, different ways to do that and maybe take some lessons learned uh, from ARIA as we go along this model. Uh, we ended with uh, some road mapping ideas from the workshop. Uh, so Dominique Hazel Massou, uh, it was one of the organizers from the W3C. He did a great job. He's basically, if you go to the website and, and want to dig into any of the different talks from the workshop, he put all of that together, got it all organized. Um, he collected some of our thoughts for what needs to happen next. Um, so some of the ideas discussed for um, future work with the W3C was making you know, accessible GLTF files. So those files that we said are like the JPEG of images. What, what other metadata um, could we add into this? Uh, accessible HTML support for GLTF. Uh, best practices for making like web components or GUI components in WebXR accessible. Um, considering the complete content chain, uh, semantic XR data model, sensory and experiential annotations, annotating annotations, so the idea that if we have AI creating, you know, the baseline of annotations, how could we override or have humans that have a better understanding of what it is include those annotations for other people? And a framework for reporting accessibility issues um, you know, one of the things that comes out of this, there's a lot of different manufacturers making these devices. They're all using different, you know, technologies. They're changing every year. How do we make sure that those companies do build in accessibility, but then also consider standards, you know, like at what point can we have standards um, across these devices? And at what point can we start expecting, you know, when these devices come out, they do work for people with disabilities. Um, and then my last example before we do the Q&A was I just did another um, thought example inside of the hubs um, and I think shows a challenge you have currently um, with WebXR is I can choose images from like a Google image search and insert them into my hubs. So this is just taking like a regular image that would have an alt text, right, if we were looking at this image on the web, but it's not gonna have that information when we bring it you know, from like a website where we can set an alt into this virtual environment. 
So this um, was actually um, an example of uh, the exhibit, the Excess uh, Plus Ability exhibit that was here at the Cooper Hewitt. Um, and I was able to uh, sync up with Ruth before to get a link to the particular image um, that I was showing in that demo. So this was uh, the suit prototype. And the Cooper Hewitt has a great right, data model where you can get information on every object right, that's in the collection. So I think it's a really cool idea to see this is all web technologies. In theory, you could have you know, these renderings or these images. If we had the plumbing for accessibility, we'd be able to connect in that virtual environment, uh, pull in all this information, get all these rich details about the object. And you know, it's, it's very potentially close here at the Cooper Hewitt because they do have you know, this type of model where all the objects are cataloged and uh, metadata associated. So maybe future project. Um, you can get involved. So the, uh, this is the link to the W3C just workshop, all the different decks, all the contact details. All the participants are also listed on the site. So there's at least 50 or 60 people on the site that are interested um, in this space. There's the Immersive Web Working Group, which is from the W3C. And there's also the XR Access Initiative, which is a, a working group also focused on making augmented and virtual reality accessible to people with all abilities. Um, and so Shiri Azenkot uh, from Cornell Tech that presented at one of our previous meetups, she's sort of the New York City representative for this group. So if you have interest in any of these areas, it's an open working group. They have a call for participation right now. And with that, let's go. Thanks for listening, and we'll have some Q&A. Thank you. Questions? Comments? I had a nitpick. You talked about uh, does we have closed captions in, in this uh, meetup, whereas I would say they're open captions. Hmm. Open captions. Xia. Hello. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you. I actually learned more from your presentation as a layman <laughs> than I did probably in the two days because I needed a translator. So you just translated a bunch of things. Uh, thank you. <laughs> but also, I wanted to say I, I think what was really powerful that I took away from it is there are certain things that we don't think about till we're in that scenario. So, for example, the example you gave about, you know, maybe people can't move their head, or Wendy stuck out to me, and and your presentation stuck out to me just because you gave so many immersive examples. Sorry, Chuck, you didn't make the cut tonight, but you were there in Seattle, um, and uh, no, and I I think. Uh, you really gave us an immersive experience, but also I think Wendy's point, which again, I'm always coming at it as an end user, so forgive me for not being as technical as most of the people in this room, but I thought it was really powerful that she made the point, you know, it's very distracting. If you're trying to enjoy a piece of art or a wonderful design, you're not necessarily going to be able to look at the interpreter, look at the captioning, look at everything all at once and enjoy the artwork in front of you. Um, and so that really stuck with me. And I, I think it's wonderful that everyone you mentioned has come at it from so, so many different standpoints, whether it's, am I saying it, the ambi, ambisonic, you know. Anyway, just to be among people who are so creative and thinking uh, in, in these ways was very uh, powerful. Um, but I, I just think that it, it was really interesting to think about, even as a person with a disability, we don't know every disability there is. So I also feel like I have more of a sense of what some of the limitations are, but then also I got a really powerful sense uh, of what is being done about it. So thank you guys for doing that for us. Yeah. 
I, I was going to comment too, just mentioning Wendy's uh, work at RIT. So she was working with uh, students, uh, I think, not sure the, the grade level, but she pointed out just from her user testing that you need to have a way to lock down these XR um, devices more to keep it in sort of like a kiosk mode because she was saying just from her user studies, the students were like, you know, just excited to be playing around with the technology and not, not staying focused, you know, on what she designed. So I thought that was an interesting observation. So um, another add-on to Wendy's talk was very interesting. She was asking questions in the beginning, um, how we actually enjoy movie theaters or like uh, open plays. And if you have a live interpreter or any kind of uh, person that, is, that requires certain light, you're actually disruptive towards the scene setting. So you have like another spot of light. And that uh, yeah. she, she mentioned that was majorly embarrassing for her to like be in need of something that's distracting other people. And with the XR headset, that kind of fell away and it, it kind of empowered her more, being more inclusive and less of a factor that causes uh, more attention that she wants and, and is required to have. So it was really interesting to see that kind of aspect to it. Mm -hmm. And we don't get that kind of insight unless someone from that side speaks about uh, the, the, the friction and the kind of remedies that are currently in place, which uh, like the XR technology will directly like remedy uh, like take away and and make perfect so it was really really interesting yeah and one last thing to your point too i thought it was interesting she brought up kids mm -hmm. you know um so you mentioned students but I, I i remember she specifically said that you know kids get distracted and you give them something as cool as a headset and I think who who made the point also that you may want to use this headset doesn't mean you want to walk outside with a headset mm. on, right? I, I remember from Connectability Challenge, somebody c created something that looked like a robo, I don't know, just like a helmet or something. And um, Gus, who worked with me, who was blind, was like, I'm not wearing that outside. Like, <laughs> no way. Um, so I think, yeah, it was great to see sort of, obviously you guys often have to work in a vacuum to create this. But it was awesome to see kind of um, the things we could learn about living with the technology or actually using the technology, the things that come up that we don't necessarily expect. So, that's good. anyway, thank you. Hi, Thomas. Hello. Thank you very much. This was very informative. Um, I was wondering if you can go into how the device makers themselves for XR experiences have tried to bake in, if they have, um, kind of standardization of user controls at the device level. So I know that's um, a common issue with accessibility that doesn't get talked about enough is mm -hmm. the fact that there's so many different assistive technologies and device types, and each of those come in with their come with their own baked in user controls uh, and a lot of the times those aren't standardized for accessibility from one to the next. So is that something that's being worked on in the XR community? Yeah, so I mean, I, my knowledge is as fresh as, you know, the whatever release that I've, I've tried of all these different products. So they are obviously constantly updating and innovating. Um, I'd say generally most of the work I've seen for accessibility in the space has been app specific and people have you know coded in support for like subtitles like there's not a platform level way on like oculus to say i prefer subtitles and so then as a developer of any application i could say oh they want subtitles let me turn those on for you so there's that kind of idea it exists right on like ios and android but we need that kind of model um, on these devices so that then people that are building experiences can implement them in. Um, but I think, you know, like definitely those companies are part of the conversation and are very involved in the W3C group and in the um, XR Access Initiative. So it's encouraging that they are, you know, they have people dedicated on their teams to, to work on accessibility. Um, but I guess it's just the speed of that. I'm always impatient. I want it to be accessible now. So. You know, a lot of the stuff that I was seeing, I think Hubs is a really cool one to work with because in Web XR it does let you do um, and explore a lot of the different ideas. And it's great that Mozilla, you know, 
has people dedicated on working on the accessibility for that and has it in their plans. So I think that'll be an interesting place to stay tuned to. For questions? Hi. Um, so I think you alluded to this a bit earlier with like maybe we could push Oculus to add accessibility at the OS level. Um, what do you think is potentially like the highest priority items in order to push accessibility more like kind of like a domino effect in X in XR? Um, I mean, definitely the assumption I would think is our legal system um, here in the United States because that's always been something that has helped get accessibility going. I think it's interesting that you have some of these experiences already going into like the public school system. So you already have people being excluded immediately now. So that's kind of my opinion on it. Like if you're already trying, or these companies are making money selling to like government agencies, that's a good place to potentially really advocate for that. I think the people that are making those procurements need to be educated that they you know, should demand that, get that into their contracts, request, request that information. That's definitely one way. Um, but yeah, as far as like the places to start, like I was very much at least starting from what exists on like current web today, uh, iPhone, Android. It's sort of like, why should we completely start over on these new devices? There's a lot of things that already directly apply. And I think that's just something that you know, we'll just have to see as they come out. But that's, if you guys have any other ideas, you know, I, I, like, I like definitely communicating and as much as possible, you know, if you do purchase one of the devices, giving that feedback to them. I mean, it's very important. A lot of people don't realize that there are people working in accessibility in those organizations and it really helps to get real feedback and comments from the community. Because if, if they don't receive those, it's hard for them to make the case internally. So the more that you can communicate those, it, it helps the people that are working in those organizations. And just to follow up to that, um, I'm curious because you mentioned the US has certain policies that they're behind on. Have you noticed um, anything that in your time in Japan, have you noticed them doing anything better that we can learn from, especially in this area? <laughs> well, <clears throat> still in still in my uh, you know, learning, learning what it, everything that is happening in Japan. I would say that um, it's kind of uh, it. My experience so far has been that Japan looks to America as like more of the role model and leader because we do have progress being made, and they they don't necessarily have the legal requirements or the societal awareness that technology can have these features built in. So my observation has been physical access, the transit, everything about navigating the physical world, really great and superior. But when you get into the technology parts, they haven't had even some of the you know, work that we've been doing, say, 10 or 15 years ago. There's not like people scanning the websites or thinking about the screen reader conformance. So 